Hey, Susan, thank you for joining me today on Tarlcast. Really appreciate you having here. Um, you recently wrote a book in 2020 on uh, aging, but more specific to aging was aging combined with you know aspects of feminism that we need to focus on, where not only do people get segregated in our current society, you know, because of, you know, race, color, creed. But then when it comes to the age of their body, a physical thing that no one can stop or can control, people tend to isolate these individuals from opportunities. And then to go even further, if you find yourself in some marginalized subset of a, bio, a biological factor or a gender choice, that you may, you know, find it more difficult for you to find these opportunities in our current society, being a woman choosing to be a woman. And then if you're an older woman, you know, the odds are really not in your favor. So how is it that you came to, first of all, writing this book? Why is it such a focus? Why do you think they need to have such a voice right now? Why is it timely? Well, I have been writing about the uh, images of women in the media for quite a while. And I have to confess, it has had something of an autobiographical element to it as I've moved through my own life and also watched my daughter, you know, grow up and uh, some of the media fare that was on offer to her. And so when I became, as we say, politely a woman of a certain age, I mm -hmm. uh, became quite interested in the images of women, or really the lack thereof, of older women in the media and what that meant for public policy, uh, workplace practices, uh, women's economic uh, success and security. And the uh, really striking thing here, Alexander, is that there are more women over 50 in our country than at any other time in our history. So this is a real demographic revolution. And it's something I thought we should begin to pay attention to because ageism and especially gendered ageism remains one of the most persistent and really acceptable biases in our country. Interesting. And so, you know, and I, I thought that you had interesting data around this point. Now, we live in a world of perspective. And so when we're inundated with marketing material in media, that gives us sort of this synthetic perspective of how the world should operate. The truth is distorted. And then from that, the fact that the natural factor that's going to occur is that people are going to put people in boxes. And, you know, you, you made this point about, and there's a study on Hollywood for if you're looking at men in films over a certain age, as opposed to women, I think it was like, what, three to one, four to one, five to one, six to one. The ratio is completely off. Where does this, where does this begin? Is it, is it because media drives it? Or is it more of the patriarchal society that we have, the patriarchal design of finance, and how we've towed away from matriarchal societies, which are things of the you know early ancestral past that humans used to have? What is it that continues to put this male focus in play where that's where the power is and that when people see age come in and then gender, the value of humans seems to tailor off? But I find that wisdom increases with age one would hope. So why, why do we see that inverse? Well, you know, look, we've always had a patriarchal society here in the mm -hmm. United States. And of course, that means that media industries have for decades and decades been uh, governed primarily by uh, white men, including older white men. And when you don't have women, period, let alone older women uh, right. in the media, their perspectives are simply not there. Couple that with the fact that the advertising industry in particular is very youth oriented. They want to get people when they're young uh, because they have this, uh, I think, misconception that if they get you to like a certain product when you're 12, 14, 20, they have you for life. Right. And, and that's actually not true. But uh, particularly since the baby boom 
became such a huge market. Uh, Madison Avenue and the media they support have been very youth oriented. So you have an intersection between a biased focus towards the young, uh, and especially young women and, uh, a, a media system that regards older women as past their prime, as dispensable, well, as the, not relevant anymore. That doesn't make any sense, considering the fact that if women are living longer, right, if they have higher access to education now than they ever had in the United States here in particular, they have more resources, financial resources. And if I understood one of the Nielsen studies correctly, the data says that individuals 60 and over watch far more TV and media than the younger millennials, which are they're focusing the ads on to even capture revenue from them. So why is it that, you know, the the generation of older women are being pushed to the side? Why is it that the focus doesn't make any logical sense? What is with that? It doesn't make any logical sense. I mean, for years, Nielsen didn't even count people over 50. You know, hmm. they were irrelevant. And this was crazy. <laughs> so much television, uh, as you pointed out, skewed older. Now, I do think, you know, and the study you cited, which was uh, something the that was done by the Annenberg School uh, at USC in 2016, found that nearly 79% of the older characters in film, 73% of the older characters on broadcast TV, and 70% of the older characters on cable were all male, even though older women, you know, after a certain age, outnumber men. And this is a residue of age-old biases about older people in general and older women in particular. Having said that, we are seeing now, and we are in a turnstile moment, because older female actors, whether it's uh, Meryl Streep or mm -hmm. Diane Keaton or uh, Bette Midler, right. um, you know, are um, uh, Jean Smart. They are not wanting to be put out to pasture. Some of these women actually have clout and they are starting to get really important parts, both in cable and streaming services and in movies. So older female celebrities are pushing the envelope. Uh, you, you look at uh, Grace and Frankie, a huge hit for Netflix, right. you know, now in its sixth season, I believe. Why is that? Because everyday women who are over 50 are also reinventing what it is to be an older woman. They're working longer. Uh, you know, 33% of women between the ages of 65 and 70 are still working. 17% of women, 70 to 75, are still working. Some of them because they love their jobs and don't want to quit, and some of them because they have to. So older, everyday women are out in the world living their lives very differently than older women of a previous generation. And Hollywood is very slowly, but it is beginning to catch up to this demographic revolution. Do you know, that's really interesting. So, you know, I told you earlier, I'm, I'm currently down in Florida. And from the places called the villages and everywhere else, they're not retirement communities. They're 55 plus. And I tell you, there is more spending money more leisure time, and more of those people in that age bracket, men and women alike, doing more physical activity than I even do, right? I'm nowhere even near that, right? But to watch that, it's like, you know, if anything, it's untapped. You know, in the in the retail market for people moving into housing, home ownership, right, inside these places, you know, they get it. It makes a lot of sense. But the perspective from the outside is that people have these stereotypes and they think that value drops with age. And I think that we need to work to invert that because there's so much data, even in the medical sense, which you talked about, to say that when, you know, doctor students, right, students that are, you know, getting their MD, if they don't establish a relationship in their studies with people over the age of 55 and up, 60 and up, what they find is that there's a lot of misdiagnoses for what's going on because they think it's just a function of age when it really could be the same thing that might affect an infant 
or a millennial, you know, or anybody, you know, in between. And I think, you know, it was right here. This was the quote. And as soon as you hit 65 and go to the doctor's office, you're bombarded with questionnaires about falling down, how good your memory is, whether you had a bowel movement in the last fortnight. Listen, I understand that there are some stereotypes. The body, like anything else, with age, things change. But it doesn't mean that absolutely everyone begins to have certain failures at the same point. So I think that that false perspective is actually doing a disservice. There's a lot of, you know, older women, specifically in the United States, that have so much value they can deliver, even in the workplace, outside of it. But, you know, there are a lot of opportunities that aren't available to them. So where do we look for that sort of solve? Because outside of medical research, right, with misdiagnosing because of ageism, and then moving into, you know, the economy we're currently in, how do we start to make those opportunities ripe again, Susan? You know, I think that uh, I, older women are needing to and beginning to reach out to younger women. Feminism okay. does not end when you're 50 years old, right? Feminism right. should be a mode of support and sustenance and activism throughout your whole life. And so what are older women told? Uh, the biggest word that bombards us is defy, defy aging, as if we can defy an ineluctable biological process That's that my point. Yeah. affects every person unless you die young. It's right. the one ism, ageism, no one can escape. And this is why it is very important to have uh, older people and younger people, older women and younger women, talk to each other more, become more active politically across the generations, and to make younger people aware of the pitfalls of ageism, as you very rightly point out. There are now some programs at hospitals in New York where medical students are being introduced to people in their 70s and 80s, mm -hmm. not patients, just regular people. And right. they're learning that these regular people uh, are not sick all the time. They're not decrepit. They're not lonely. They're not uh, losing their minds. Uh, they are fully functioning, uh, many sexually active and physically active people. And these kinds of training programs are actually helping to counter the sorts of stereotypes that you're talking about that will lead a doctor, say, to ascribe something you're feeling as in your head or just a sign of age when, in fact, you actually have some kind of infection, right? right. Um, so, you know, really countering these stereotypes across the board is is really important. You know, I've had older women tell me that as they're raising their own consciousness about age and ageism, you know, and they'll be, and it's tiny steps. They'll be in a restaurant and let's say they're 75 years old and they're there with the, uh, you know, adult children yes. and the waiter will not talk to her, but talk to the adult children. And these women are saying, excuse me, I am here and I'm the one paying the bill. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, older women are beginning to speak up in the workplace when they are overlooked, when they are interrupted, when their comments are ignored and saying, excuse me, citing their experience and yep. insisting that they not be interrupted. There are all kinds of steps, large and small, that older women are taking because they're fed up. Do you know... This this is this is the data is showing us it, it's telling us there's a difference between telling and showing. The data is telling us that there is a social conditioning that has happened in our society that marginalizes people. And how we look at things is incorrect. The data is telling us that. But in, if we look at the stance of those doctors establishing relationships with individuals outside of the hospital. It's almost like you need to bring the data close to home. You have to make it personal for people for them to really understand. That's one of the greatest difficulties is you can have 
studies all day long, all this information. But unless the only time human understanding occurs is when people can actually experience that thing. So the data can be screaming at us, but people need to experience the truth that is out there that the data is telling us to look for, essentially where to look. So when I, when I see this and I see these studies, how is it do you think that we should take this data and make these experiences personal? How is it that we take what we see here, even in the United States and the data we have, and how do we apply that to other cultures where there's even stronger, you know, patriarchal structure, whether it's in the house itself or things outside of it, or women at all having any opportunity to get into the workplace? Because there's women who listen to this from 222 countries across the globe. So it's like, how do we continue to transition it and make sure not only it works in the United States, but it also works for women everywhere? Well, <laughs> you know, we like to think that we've, you know, made a lot of progress in this country, but we're, we're actually doing terrible when it comes to gender equity. And mm-hmm. we're also doing terrible when it comes to age and age equity. Um, the World Health Organization, uh, just this last year has, uh, named ageism as a global problem that is, uh, really serious around the world. But let's try to compare ourselves first to countries that are doing much better than we who's are. Doing, who's doing much better? Don't say Sweden, because that's not fair. They're always at like the top. They are. <laughs> Iceland. Yep. Iceland, um, Finland, Norway. Yes, the Nordic countries. Iceland, yep. 47% of you know people in their legislature are women. Finland, 47% in their legislature are are women. Um, and there is, uh, you know, major studies around, uh, about gender equity around the world. And we're actually behind Tunisia, Ecuador, and Bolivia in terms of, you know, how we are performing across women's political involvement, women's economic security, women's health and women's educational attainment. Wait, well, yeah, that, that's really interesting. Are there, are there examples for that so that I can understand that? You know, when people say we're behind, well, well, comparatively, like how far up the highway is the car compared to where you are, right? Are they doing 100 miles an hour, you know, supporting women, you know, women of age, right? What's, what's the differential look like comparatively to us here in the United States? Well, in terms of women in general, we rank 75th in the world in terms of the number of women in national legislatures. And this even after the 2018 election, when more women were elected. 75th, we rank 55th in uh, infant mortality rates. We're lower than we were in 1960. And Mm. we're behind Cuba, Estonia, Slovenia, uh, not to mention the developed uh, European countries. So uh, overall, when you look at women as a group, uh, the America is so behind, you know, only 4.8% of fortune 500 companies have uh, a female CEO. So, you know, across the board, when it comes to uh, sexual harassment, assaults on women's reproductive health, which is, you know, huge right now in our country, yep. the glass ceiling, pay inequity, job segregation, no child care. We are an embarrassment when it comes to paid uh, maternity leave, paid paternity leave, and decent, um, affordable child care. Hmm. You know, so uh, you take that as all women, and then you think about older women and, you know, the um, poverty that older women, many of them, face. You know, in Um, In 2019, half of all older adults had 27,000 annually in yearly income. In 2019, the annual median income for men over 65 was just over 36,000. For women, it was 21,000. So I know you're talking about seeing, you know, these semi-gated communities um, where privileged 
mostly white people live. Right. And it can give the impression that older people are rolling in dough. Now, <laughs> Nielsen did a study in 2012 excoriating advertisers for ignoring baby boomers because many of them had so much disposable income and right. nothing was being advertised to them except, you know, the big pharma stuff, uh, you know, that we, that bombards us on the nightly news and the weather channel. But on the other end of the spectrum, Alexander, uh, our country is terrible when it comes to older people without resources. They are trying to live on money that puts them, you know, below th the poverty limit. And uh, it's so frustrating to me that, you know, Biden's build back better agenda, which is such a female and family friendly agenda can't get through Congress. Well, you gotta, you gotta think about how, um, the, the people who are in our Congress, right? It's the exact same thing that you're trying to speak up against that sort of structure, right? It's, it's, it's glaring at us. It's in our face, but it's, very hard to make that sort of change in those systems, right? So how is it, Susan, that we're going to take the data, right? We're going to take the experiences and we're going to take the people that are truly affected and other individuals that support those people that are affected and get them to come together and facilitate the proper change and opportunity needed for those groups. Where do we, where do we set our focus. What is the first target we need to look at and how do we do it collaboratively? Well, you know, the first target, which is the biggest, biggest problem facing the United States is the inequitable distribution of wealth. Hmm. That is our biggest problem. And it, of course, affects women. It, of course, affects people of color. And it seems to be an almost intractable problem, not because everyday people don't support fixing it. They do. Everyday people, you look at public opinion polls, people want the super wealthy taxed. They don't want the super wealthy shoving all their money off into, you know, offshore tax havens. Mm -hmm. They want Jeff Bezos to pay his fair share of taxes. But we have, you know, so I'm telling you, I don't have a good answer to your question because you're asking a very big and important question. How can we remedy our political system so that it is not constantly always working for the rich at the expense of everybody else. And our big problems that contribute to that are gerrymandering, for example, the structure of the Senate, where, yep. you know, you have uh, states like Wyoming and North Dakota and South Dakota having the same representation as New York and Texas and uh, California. So we have really big structural problems that many of us recognize. And we just shake our fist at the cosmos in terms of trying to fix that big problem. And that's the big one from which everything else stems. And so, you know, various of us are out there writing our books, giving our talks to whoever will listen to us about the need for uh, social justice and equality across the board in our country. And we're very passionate about it. And sometimes it just feels like there aren't enough <laughs> podcasts and public lectures, you know, in the country to, uh, to affect the kind of changes that the majority of Americans want. So are these, it, it's it's not going to happen anytime soon, not in my foreseeable future or probably many generations after me, that a completely socialist agenda, which you may find in, you know, more Scandinavian countries of the sort, would come in offering more public services to help those who lack opportunity. Um, 
to access to, you know, healthcare, childcare, things of the sort. And even more so those groups, which are 60 plus, and even more so beyond that women, right? So if, if I understand it correctly, it's not so much about taxing the rich. It's people actually asking for resources like the ones I just stated that can help them regardless of the income level, because these are the things that are typically most difficult for them to get, right? To find the time to actually achieve that unless you have more exorbitant amounts of wealth, which are brackets they actually just don't sit in. So is that really what it is? It's not so much of the you know, politically coming in, say, tax those people that are wealthy, but really change the structure of our spending so that it adds more social programs in place that afford those the things that are actually needed for them. Because money actually doesn't solve anything. But giving people opportunity, putting those systems in place and the ability for them to go use it, I would see that would be a different sort of change. Do you see where I'm headed with that? Well, I, I do think money matters. I think if if you took some money out of our completely bloated defense budget. Oh, I know. The F-22, all that stuff. I, that I get, right? Yeah, right that which, which passed, Alexander, you know, several weeks ago, not a peep, not a peep, right? But this $3.5 billion Build Back Better plan, which is, you know, nobody talks about, oh, it's spread out over 10 years it is actually affordable yeah if you got a fit, rid of got rid of a few of those aircraft carriers and fighter jets that don't work and you put that money into affordable child care of you know paid family leave uh you know a, an infrastructure a human infrastructure for more teachers to yep. pay child care workers what they're worth, to have more support for older people who do need in-home care. The money does matter. And, you know, but you're right. People have to agitate for it. Yeah, that's, you know, it's, it's tough. It's tough. Well, listen, I got to tell you, Susan, you've written a book, which is for some people a very hot topic and for others it's a topic they've never even focused on so the work you're doing does not go unnoticed and it's important that we have these conversations so that individuals can understand the full complexity of really what is going on here and that when they walk outside walk out of their homes or even look to their own family members maybe there is a one percent shift in perspective because that 1% shift across billions of people or 330 million in the United States can make a dramatic difference. Well, you know, I think it is very important to raise people's awareness of ageism. You know, it's so woven into the weft and warp of our society that it goes kind of unnoticed and taken for granted that older people can be dismissed, that they can be marginalized, that they're thought of as, you know, lonely, decrepit, sick all the time. And so, you know, I teach, you know, at a university and I teach about the media. And of course, I have to teach about how the media uh, represent certain kinds of identities, uh, gender, race, etc. And so I've started teaching about ageism. And it is one of the isms that my students are most taken aback by because they haven't even thought about it. You know, right, that's my point. Yeah. And so the more you can make people aware that this is an ism that is destructive marginalizing has severe economic and political consequences and will affect every person because we all age unless we fix it. Um, you know, it's, it's not going to get better. So people in their twenties, thirties and forties, they need to start thinking about this in alliance with their parents, their grandparents, older people they know and love. Right. Well, listen, Susan, you've said it and the data is there that supports what you have to say about this. And so just as much as we have a global pandemic, there are other longer, more entrenched things that are just as crippling to our society that require our focus and attention. So thank you very much for coming on today to speak to me about it. Well, thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. 
Most definitely. And if, if people want to read more about your work, your studies, the books, anything regarding that, where should they go? Well, uh, the book is called In Our Prime, How Older Women Are Reinventing the Road Ahead. Uh, and of course, it's available, you know, in uh, local bookstores and, um, of course, Amazon. <laughs> right. Jeff Bezos, pay your damn, pay your damn taxes, right? right. <laughs> but sell my book. <laughs> uh, yeah. that's too funny. And you have a personal website that people can go to to learn more about you? Yes, it's SusanJDouglas.com. Um, Beautiful. Well, listen, Susan, seriously, thank you again for coming on. I really appreciate it. It helps enlighten me. I'm educated, ed- educate, more educated now. Can't even talk straight. And also helps educate those that get to listen to it. And that's really important. Well, thank you very much, Alexander. Appreciate it.